In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. This gospel text is something that we hear quite often on the occasion of a funeral. In fact, ironically, I've actually preached on this text twice already in the past 10 days at two separate funerals. We hear these reassuring words of Jesus and cannot but think of the eternal place God has prepared for us at the end of our earthly pilgrimage. There is a place beyond this fragile earth, our island home, from which the great cloud of witnesses encircles us all. However, it would be a mistake only to imagine this text as a word about the world to come. This is a text that is equally relevant to our life here and now, relevant to things on this side of the Jordan. Turn back the calendar, if you will, about a month and a half ago or so, into the middle of Holy Week, to Maundy Thursday. Yes, that's where this story takes place. It unfolds in the upper room. So why are we back here? Where is the Easter good news here? Let us see what we can discover together. Jesus has gathered with his disciples for a final meal. He has washed their feet, and now they are talking turkey. Judas has snuck out the back door off to the religious authorities where he will betray and turn Jesus over for 30 pieces of silver. Jesus is facing certain death, and Peter will deny him, and the flock will scatter. The relationship between Jesus and his disciples as they have known it is coming to an end. He is leaving, and to top it off, he implies that they should know where he is going. However, they do not. They do not have a clue. You know the way that leads to where I go. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Jesus seeks to reassure his followers that things will sort out. However, it sort of falls flat, sort of like in those moments when my wife and I are in sort of a stressful situation and I tell her to relax. That oddly doesn't usually work in my household. And it's not working here. This is heavy stuff, and they are wigging out, understandably so. He is trying to reassure them. Thomas, as usual, is the guy who speaks up and says what is probably on everyone else's mind. You are leaving, creating a place for us, but we do not know the way. However, will we find the way? We know this, Thomas, and we know this question he raises. This is a question we ask ourselves at an emotional and spiritual level throughout all our lives. Where are we going and how are we going to get there? However, this morning, I'm a little bit more curious to have us think about Philip's imperative. And unfortunately, it didn't get printed in your bulletin this morning. But Marcella read it beautifully. Show us the Father and we will be satisfied. I suspect you could have heard a pin drop in the room as Philip essentially presses Jesus for some hard evidence and essentially asks the question, what does God look like? Understandably, in those stressful moments when the bottom falls out, we seek some reassurance, some strong something to hold on to. Perhaps this is what Philip needs now, a word of confidence and hope to help him through the storm, or in street language, he is perhaps asking this question. It would be helpful to know before all this happens if all of this is real or just a pile of white lies we tell ourselves so that we can sleep better at night. No faithful Jew tuned in would in this context have dared ask the question, show us the Father. In the Hebrew psyche, it is a fearful thing to gaze upon the divine. Moses once made a similar request to that of Philip. He encountered God many times in Theophany and on the mountain and through the burning bush and in the tent, but he wanted more. He wanted to see the face of God. He wanted to see God face to face. Yahweh made clear to Moses that that can't happen, but he did relent, Moses being Moses, to allow him to get a glance of him as God walked past him. 
Later on in the Torah, we have the story of Jacob, who after surviving his wrestling match with God by the Jacob River, reported, quote, I have seen the face of God and have lived to tell about it. Seeing God, face to face that is, is risky business. Since there have been few to no immediate face-to-face encounters with the Father, we have little evidence in the world of art on the subject. On the contrary, there are many depictions of the person of Jesus. There's one over there, Good Shepherd. There's another one here in Oak. And then there's the stick em up Jesus here in the big window above the altar. That one. That image of what we know to be the historical Jesus that Middle Eastern Jewish man with the long hair. There's tons in art about that Jesus. However, the Father, not so much. I'm aware of a few attempts, and in fact, I'm really only aware of two. The first is the all-seeing eye, or the eye of providence. And you've seen it all your life, whether you know it or not. It's right up there. That's not the Trinity, that triangle. That is the all-seeing eye of God. And it's very often found in these Victorian buildings right up there. You've also seen it on the dollar bill. It's that eye that is radiating right over the pyramid. It is sort of an Orwellian image of of a God keeping an eye on things. Our founding fathers loved that image because they were deists. They believed in a God that was cold and distant, sort of out there, just sort of watching things evolve, spinning around in our universe. The eye of providence, the all-seeing eye. The other image of God the Father, of which I am aware, is the famous fresco on the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. Michelangelo fashions God the Father with the long flowing beard, his hand outstretched, his finger creating Adam, Of course, the whole notion of the first person of the Trinity being depicted as a man is problematic from the start. However, Michelangelo's masterpiece is really less about depicting God the Father and more of a celebration of the Renaissance and humanism and the power of human beings to do just about anything, even create a world. So we're really not helping Philip much this morning. Then again, there is the story of the little girl who is drawing a picture at coffee hour. And a curious parishioner goes up to her and asks, what are you drawing? And the little girl replied, God. And the parishioner responded, no one knows what God looks like. To which the little girl replied, they will when I get finished with this drawing. That's the best one I've found so far. So you can see attempts To see the Father, or better, the first person of the Trinity is troublesome, and we are always caught up short. Artists can stretch our hearts and our imaginations, offering us abstract images of the Father, but in truth, God still remains too infinite, too powerful, too numinous, too holy, too other for us to see and live. Or as the French philosopher Blaise Pascal puts it, there is a hiddenness to God. If we could see God face to face, then would God not just become like every other object that comes into our lives for us to domesticate and control, something that we can use for a while and discard? Would we really want to worship and have our life in such a God that could be domesticated and controlled by us? Now, there's a question for us to ponder. So what of Philip's imperative to Jesus? Show us the Father. What of our longing to have relationship with our God, to be drawn into the power and inspiration and strength of God, to be guided into full life with God? Jesus says, I have been with you all this time and yet you still don't know me. Whoever has seen the Father has seen me. Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. We cannot but hear shades of the prologue of John's gospel echoed in here. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. No one has ever seen God. It is God, the only Son, who is close to the Father's heart 
who has made him known. Ah, there you go, Philip. No one has ever seen God. That is the cold, hard truth. You will have to take this one on faith. However, the one who is standing beside you has. And he has come among us to show us the one whom we lo- for whom we long to see. He has come to show us the Father, and he does not do so in some cheap, contrived, or concrete way. Jesus does not open his iPhone and show us a selfie of him and the Father. He does not call into evidence pictures from old family albums. Rather, he breaks bread with us all and washes our feet. He gives his life on the cross for our sake. Jesus shows us no icon, but shows us the very heart of the one who has gone to great extremes to demonstrate his love for us all and this world he has made. In Jesus, we see the face of God and live. In Jesus, we see the God who returns to a bedraggled and dispirited and hopeless band of bedraggled disciples on their worst day and comes and robs the grave of its power and fills them with hope and begins the great work of restoration, healing, and reconciliation and continues it still in us. Amen.